In this video, we're going to continue exploring cross-tabulation. In particular, we're going to look at a measure of association called Yule's Q, and then take a look at probabilities, odds, and odds ratios. We'll have another video that will look at the, another measure of association called Gamma, but we're going to put that off till later so we can tackle these two topics first. We talked about calculating chi-square, and we know that that's a test of independence with a null, null and alternative hypothesis. But what it doesn't measure is how strong the relationship is. It'd be nice to have a single statistic that describes whether, whether there's no relationship or a complete relationship or something in between, the degree of the relationship. Our textbook goes through several different measures of association, and there's a lot of them available out there. Why do we have so many measures of association? Well, some of them are only appropriate for particular kinds of data. For example, we're going to show you Yule's Q in a minute, and that's only appropriate when you have a two by two cross tabulation table. Some are better for some measures are better when you have larger tables than that. And finally, some of the measures have different kinds of properties, different statistical properties that are appropriate to different kinds of problems. But we're going to simplify this quite a bit, and we're going to look at Yule's Q in this particular video look at odds and odds ratios as a way of understanding our cross tabulation and then in another video we'll look at a, at a measure of association called gamma. One thing that all these measures of association have is they give us a statistic that's relatively easily interpretable. For example, Yule's Q will be a measure that will always be between minus one and one. A value of zero means that there's no correlation or no association or that the two measures are, are absolutely independent of each other. Values closer to 1 or negative 1 mean that there's a very strong or perfect relationship between the two measures. One of the nice things about Yule's Q when you have a 2 by 2 table is that it's very easy to calculate. I've labeled these cells starting from the upper left and going to the right A, B, C, and D. Our formula for Yule's Q then is simply what are called the cross products BC minus AD divided by BC plus AD. The BC and the ADs are the cross products. And you'll remember that when we looked at our cross tabulation in chi-square, that when we have extreme relationships where there's a high degree of correlation or association between two variables, they tend to cluster in those off-diagonal elements, for example in the AD or the BC. Yule's Q captures that notion that if there's a strong correlation that these off-diagonal cells, or sorry, the cells on the diagonal will, will have large values in them, and the off-diagonals will have smaller values in them. We looked at an example before where we looked at the, at the relationship between race, whether GSS respondents are white or black, and whether they favor or oppose capital punishment. I've gone ahead and reproduced this table here. You can see from this table that of all the white respondents, 74% of them favor capital punishment compared to about 43 percent of the black respondents. So we're observing about a 30 percentage point difference between white and black respondents who favor capital punishment. That's a very substantively large difference. We can go ahead and calculate Yule's Q. You can see the calculation down below. Pretty easy to do. We take the cross products BC minus AD divided by BC plus AD and we get a Yule's Q of minus 0.59. We had a chi-square coefficient of 149.78, so we know that this particular relationship is statistically significant, and now we can conclude on a scale from minus 1 to 1, where the two extremes, the 1's, indicate perfect relationships and 0, no relationship, that we have a moderate or strong relationship between these two measures. The table on the right is a little bit of a guideline to help you understand this particular measure. There's nothing magic in this table. This is really my experience versus the book's experience. I would say that I tend to be more optimistic statistically than the book. And by that I mean when I see a value like 0.59, I tend to think of this as a strong relationship. The book, however, on page 150, classifies this as a moderate relationship. They're less optimistic about the strength of the relationship than I am. I'm not certain who's right, the authors of the book or me. My experience leads me to be a bit more optimistic. And some of this is just interpretive, and it would take several years of you using these kinds of statistics to gain a, a level of comfort to be able to stake your own claim to the kinds of outcomes that you think are um, important. Let's take a look at 
an, an example where I've made up the numbers. Now, this particular table, I'm again looking at white versus black versus favor or opposed capital punishment. I've created this table so the marginal distributions match the actual marginal distributions in the general social survey. But I've reallocated the cases so that my Yule's Q shows that there is no relationship here. So again, if we go ahead and calculate Yule's Q, in this case, we get a value of 0 0.003. Here's an example on the bottom that has the same marginal frequencies and I've again reallocated them but this time so that there's a perfect relationship. Now what do I mean by perfect here? If I know a person's race I can perfectly predict whether they favor or oppose capital punishment. For example, a hundred percent of the white respondents favor capital punishment and a hundred percent of the black respondents oppose capital punishment. When I calculate Yule's Q in this case I get a Yule's Q of minus 1, which tells me that there's no error. This is a very strong relationship. In, in fact, quite frankly, if I were to observe this relationship without making up the data, I would say it's unbelievably strong. I would have concerns that I made a calculation error or the data were collected improperly. But having said that, these two examples show the two extremes for Yule's Q. The table at the top shows a distribution of white and black respondents by whether they favor or oppose capital punishment. And yes, I've made that up, but I've done it in such a way that we can see that there's no correlation, no relationship between those measures. Knowing one's race wouldn't lead me to change my opinion or understanding of the distribution of whether they favor or oppose capital punishment. On the other hand, the example at the bottom shows that if I know one's race, I would absolutely know perfectly their attitudes about capital punishment. So I knew if I were looking at a white person, they would favor capital punishment. Or if, I, or if I was using a black person that they would oppose capital punishment. Those two extremes are what we're trying to capture with Yule's Q and we're going to get a number that typically falls between minus one and one and again zero implies no relationship. Early on we started by looking at the relationship between gender and political ideology. Now I've redone this table a little bit. I've dropped out the moderates. I've done that so I have a two by two table. And I've done that because to calculate Yule's Q, you have to have a two by two table. We saw most of our difference, um, our gender differences taking place in the liberal and moderate categories anyways. So I'm really focusing my attention on the relationship between gender and liberalism versus conservatism. We had a chi-square statistic that led us to reject the null hypothesis, which means that we concluded that there's a statistically significant relationship between conservatism and gender. We also noted that there's about an 8 percentage point difference between men and women when it comes to liberalism and conservatism. And now we have another statistic to aid us in our interpretation. Our Yule's Q is 0.16. Using the table at the bottom, the book would conclude that there's virtually no relationship. My view of this is again a bit more optimistic, and I would say that this is a weak relationship. In fact, in some circumstances I might even call it moderate. But nonetheless, it's certainly not a strong relationship, but it's one that we can find in the data that is statistically important with an 8 percentage point difference. It's really kind of putting all these things together that gives you a good interpretation of the data. If this difference were 10 percentage points or 12 percentage points, I would have a lot more confidence in saying this is a moderate relationship. Because it's under 10, I'm a little concerned that it is, it's weak. But on the other hand, I wouldn't say there's virtually no relationship. You may have seen the Star Wars movies. One of the famous quotes out of that movie has C-3PO saying, Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. And Han Solo responds, never tell me the odds. I guess when you work with statistics long enough, you can't enjoy movies. This is not a possibility. This is an odds. If it was a possibility, it would be expressed as a probability. So C-3PO had made an error here saying that he's reporting a probability when in fact he's reporting an odds. But we're going to go ahead and look at odds anyways as another way of understanding the cross-tabulation tables. And in particular, we're going to extend that idea to examining odds ratios. A lot of statistics professors use the example of um, the Titanic sinking. This has a lot of fascination among the public. There's, a lot, there's great information on who died, 
whether they're male or female, their class, the country of origin, and so forth. And so people use this data set as a way of expressing different kinds of statistical applications. And we're going to do the same thing here. So the Titanic sank in 1912. There were approximately 2,223 people on board at the time. And of those people, approximately 1,517 died. I say approximately, I'm going to treat these as the real numbers. There is a little bit of dispute about exactly how many people were on board and exactly how many died. And you can see different data sets have slightly different numbers. But these are, are pretty good numbers. We also know that a disproportionate of men died due to the women and children first protocol. So here's what we're going to try to figure out. We're first going to express as probabilities the probability of surviving, and that's without regard to gender. Then we'll try to express the probability of surviving for the men, the probability of surviving for the women. Then we're going to take the same numbers and try to understand them as odds and calculate the odds of surviving, the odds of surviving if you're male, the odds of surviving if you're female, and then finally we're going to produce a new statistic called the odds ratio which will let us compare the odds of surviving across gender. This frequency distribution will give us the overall probability of surviving or being lost at sea. I've listed P sub S, which is the probability of surviving, as equal to, point zero, as equal to 0 0.32. And this is read right off the table. I go to the row label saved. I see there were 711 individuals out of the 2,224, or approximately 32%. Obviously, that means that 68% were lost at sea and therefore P sub L is equal to 0.68. So there's our probabilities read right off the table and these are called empirical probabilities. These are different than theoretical probabilities for example flipping a coin which we know theoretically is equal to 0.5, 1 divided by 2. But these are empirical probabilities based on what we actually observed. We can convert these to odds. Odds are basically ratios of probabilities. So an odds is the ratio of the probability of some event divided by the probability of not that event. Now in this case, we know that the probability of being saved is 0.3197, and the probability of being lost is 0.6803. Therefore, the odds of being saved are 0.4699 to 1, or approximately 0.47. We can calculate the odds another way. We can calculate the odds of being lost at sea. The odds of being lost at sea are equal to the probability of being lost, 0.68, divided by the probability of being saved, 0.32, or approximately 2.1279. And by that we mean approximately 2.1 to 2. The interpretation of this, I prefer interpreting odds that are greater than 1. And in this case, we can say that for every person that survived, approximately 2.13 were lost at sea. We can also interpret the other odds, but I find it more difficult to think about. The other odds was 0.47, and that means that for every person lost at sea, almost half of a person, or 0.47, survived. Odds are one of those things that if you're a gambler are pretty easy to understand, and it does take a little time to look at them. You know that if chance is operating, the odds are 50-50. That is, the odds of winning are 1 out of 2. The odds of surviving are 1 out of 2. The odds of being lost at sea are 1 out of 2. Let's look at a cross-tabulation table. So now I've put gender into the mix here. You notice that my independent variable is gender, female versus male. My dependent variable is being lost at sea or being saved. We know that the odds of a woman surviving now is 2.32 to 1. Now how do we calculate that? Well, the probability of being female and surviving is three, 373 divided by 300, 534, and that is it's about 0.7. The odds of being, and therefore if we do 1 minus that, that is 0.3, we get the probability of being lost at sea. The odds, therefore, which remember is the ratio of two probabilities, the probability of some event divided by the probability of not that event, the probability of being a woman, the odds of being a woman and surviving are 2.32 to 1 or approximately 0.7 divided by 0.3. This means that, for, that the 2.32 
to one means that for approximately every three people, every three women, approximately 2.32 survived. The probability of men surviving was far lower, 0.2, that is 338 divided by 1690. And therefore we can calculate the odds of men surviving, 0.2 divided by 0.8, or 0.25 to 1. In other words, for every four men, approximately one survived. Now, how could we compare these two odds? The, women, the female odds of survival is 2.32 to 1. The men's odds of survival are 0.25 to 1. You can see that the men's survival is less than chance, 1 to 1 odds, and the women's survival is greater than chance, 1 to 1 odds. One way to compare these two odds is to take the ratio of them, and we call that the odds ratio. The odds ratio of women surviving to men surviving is equal to the odds of women surviving over the odds of men surviving, and it's 2.32 divided by 0.25, or 9.27. Our interpretation here is that in this horrible mess that was the Titanic, where many people died, we see that men died at a higher rate than women. More precisely, comparing men to women, women were over nine times more likely to survive the Titanic accident than men. Well, let's go back and look at another example. Here's our cross tabulation of white versus black, white and black versus uh, capital punishment, whether people favor or oppose capital punishment. The odds of favoring capital punishment is 2.26 to 1. That is, if I ignore race, I have 0.693 divided by 0 0.307. I'm just using the percentages in the, in the row total column. On the other hand, the odds of opposing capital punishment are 0.44 to 1. But what about the odds ratios? The odds of white, favoring, white respondents favoring capital punishment is 0.742 divided by 1 minus 0.742, or 2.876 to 1. That is to say, if we look only at the white respondents, white respondents favor capital punishment with the odds of approximately 2.9 to 1. We can also calculate the odds of black respondents favoring capital punishment. And that's equal to 0.428, that is the 42.8% of black respondents who favor capital punishment, divided by 1 minus 0.428, or an odds of 0.748 to 1. Again, to compare these two odds in the same way that we compared men and women in the Titanic example, we can calculate the odds ratio. So we're going to take the odds ratio, we're going to take the ratio of the odds of whites favoring to the odds of blacks favoring capital punishment that is 2.876 divided by 0.748 and get an odds ratio of 3.8. The interpretation of this is we know that people can either favor or oppose capital punishment. We observe that there are black-white differences in the rate at which people favor capital punishment. More precisely, white respondents are 3.8 times more, the odds of a white respondent favoring capital punishment are 3.8 times greater than black respondents. There's an interesting relationship between the odds ratio and Yule's Q that we uh, calculated earlier. You can see on the lower left that Yule's Q can be calculated directly from the odds ratio. And simply put, it's the odds ratio minus 1 divided by the odds ratio plus 1, which in this case is approximately 0.59, as we calculated earlier, which again shows us that this is a moderate to strong relationship.